Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary television producer, director, and writer whose body of work is nothing short of jaw-dropping. For over five decades, he's brought us some of the greatest television variety series and specials ever made. He produced The Judy Garland Show, The Dinah Shore Chevy Show, The Share Show, and of course, his groundbreaking TV series, Laugh-In, which won him three Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe nomination. And he gave us television's first reality show, Real People. He produced the first five years of the Grammy Awards and dozens of TV specials with the greatest stars on earth, including Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Lucille Ball, Elton John, Bette Midler, Liza Minnelli, Michael Jackson, Shirley MacLaine, Diana Ross, and scores of others. He won his third Emmy Award for producing Sammy Davis Jr.'s 60th anniversary celebration. In 1987, he created, and for 15 years he produced, the American Comedy Awards. He's received every honor imaginable, including 25 Emmy Award nominations, three Emmys, three Image Awards, the Television Critics Award, the Director's Guild Award, the Producer's Guild Man of the Year, an honorary doctorate from Pepperdine University, and believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. On its 25th anniversary, the Television Academy honored him for his outstanding contribution to television. And in 1989, he was awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And later this year, he'll be releasing his highly anticipated book entitled Still Laughing, A Life in Comedy from the Creator of Laugh-In and a documentary feature film about his life and career is being produced as we speak. I am beyond thrilled to welcome the one and only George Slaughter to our show. George, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. After hearing those credits, I'm exhausted. Nice well, to be after here. living it, you must be exhausted. Yes, nice to be here. Well, George, you've brought the world so much entertainment and there's so many things I want to ask you, but I want to start with Judy Garland and her TV show. As you know, a lot has been written about that show. Mel Torme even wrote a book about it, which was not very complimentary to Judy. What was your experience of working with her? With Judy Garland? Yes. It was an adventure. I wanted to do the Judy Garland show, but I had never met her. So I wanted to be hired before I met her because I didn't know what to say to Judy Garland. So we, it's nine o'clock at night. And they tell me to come down to Mike Dan's office. I go in and there sits Judy Garland. And she was tiny, so much smaller than I thought. And I didn't know what to say because it was a surprise. And I said, uh, Miss Garland, I don't care what you may have heard about me, but there's no truth to the rumor that I'm difficult. <laughs> she looked at me, she said, you're difficult? I said, see, even you heard about it. So <laughs> she said, well, we're both difficult. Let's go have a drink. So my first meeting with Judy Garland it lasted maybe 45 seconds. We then went out and drank a lot of leap for milks. And from there on, it was an adventure. She was this very special lady, a good friend, and a fantastic performer. Now, before I ask you about Laugh-In, I want to ask you about your sense of humor. What drives your sense of comedy? Reality. I mean, you don't go much further than Donald Trump to realize the value of humor in our society. We need it. We need a, a child is born. You don't have to teach it how to laugh, how to cry, how to eat, how to sleep, or how to laugh. Babies naturally start to laugh. And it's part of our, our gift. And uh, so I've been able to capitalize on that and <laughs> part, of, part of my economy. Comedy is a major part of our life and our existence. Well, thanks to you, we've had a lot more of it than we would have had. Now, I know you got to know Rowan and Martin when you were the manager at Ciro's on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea for Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In? Well, NBC had nothing to air on Monday night. And I had all of these people that uh, were not sitcom stars, not movie stars. They were just funny people, Robin Williams and uh, Flip Wilson and all of them. And so... I went to NBC and said, I can produce this show without names and a very, very low budget. And NBC said, well, okay, because they had nothing else to put on the air. So we did. And then they said they needed a host. So Ron and Martin were available. They were just 
Matter of fact, they were about to split up, but I went to Rowan and Martin, who were a stand-up comic older than the rest of the cast, and they did not interfere with that tumult, that avalanche of funny. And so we came in and started taping, and they were wonderful. Uh, they certainly helped establish the, the presentation of the craziness that we had. How difficult was it to get NBC to give you the freedom you needed to make laugh in the kind of show you wanted it to be? It was impossible. NBC, Fred Silverman, said, he agreed. I said, I want to do this crazy. He says, okay, they had nothing else, and this show cost absolutely nothing. So when we did the pilot, we delivered to NBC. He looked, they said, this, this doesn't work. This is crazy. You, you introduce things. Well, you said, at one point, you say, we'll be right back after this, and we cut away, and you come right back. I said, well, we weren't lying. So I said, but that's it. Everything in television was so predictable. This is a show totally unpredictable with no names, nobody on the show you'd ever heard of. And the, the comedy was based upon real situations. With all of those ingredients, I understood it, but the network, the network didn't understand it. And when they saw it, they were really upset. They said, what if this is not a television show? You've taken a lot of our money and just gone out and had a good time. I said, that's pretty close to it. But they put it on the air because they had nothing else. And the first show did nothing. But by about the third week, the audience said, wait a minute, there's something happening there. And then we went out and got unpredictable people. We stopped people in the hall and said, just say sock it to me. And they said, sock it? Why would I say sock it to me? Close enough, we put that on the air. We put things on the air that anybody else would have trashed. But that all combined into an hour of craziness. And then, of course, you know, Goldie Hahn, that magic, you know. I wonder if she was a dancer. Carolyn Raskin had seen Carolyn Goldie Hawn dancing on the Andy Griffin show. He said, you must go downstairs and see this girl. She's dancing. So I said, well, I don't know. I don't, what am I going to do with a dancer? But I was absolutely enchanted. So we brought her into the office and she sat there. And it was just magic. And, uh, so we, she was not a comic and she, we weren't using dancers. So we gave her an introduction of Dan Rowan. And she screwed it up so bad, and it was adorable. But then she laughed, and we did another take, and she screwed it up again. But by the time I got to the camera, and I said, don't ever interrupt this woman again. Never, ever. I never want to hear the word stop. And so we gave her the same introduction, but we had inverted all of the words. So she got to screw that up. And she read the wrong words and read them right. And I'm like, oh, we're in trouble now. So anyhow, from there on, Goldie was magic. And then along comes Lily Tomlin who did characters. All of Lily Tomlin's characters became real individuals. The artist and the telephone operator, all of them became real people. We would cast them as a different actor. And so then Artie Johnston, Ruth Buzzy, and Joanne Worley, all of these people were funny, but not stars, and they were not funny in the normal way. Uh, they were crazy. And so we'd come in the studio, and we would tape sometimes till two o'clock in the morning, We'd tape what we had written, and then we would have them improvise. So Laugh-In was really a series of, of uh, accidents, really, predictable accidents. And we would make noises, and we would have words that we would flash up just to get their attention and to distract them. And out of that, we would then, Carolyn Raskin, a brilliant lady who developed many, if not most, of the modern editing techniques that are now used universally on videotape. Carolyn developed these techniques and would come in downstairs and put together all of these little short pieces. And some pieces were 10 seconds long and then edited together and with no explanation, no anticipation and put it on the air at eight o'clock. And then we then apologized for it while we were on the air. And that unpredictability, that craziness, that off balance caught on by the third week, we were a big hit. And from then on, I became very arrogant and NBC could not, not tell me not to do what we were doing. And so it stayed on the air for six, seven years. Now you talk about unpredictability, George, whose idea was it to invite Richard Nixon to be on the show? By the end of the first year, we were a big hit and we needed to do something to make it more visible and more exciting. And Paul Keyes was one of the writers on Laughing, and he was very, very close to Richard Nixon. So I said, can you get, Richard Nixon to do laughing. So we all got in a car, drove over to CBS where he was doing a press conference. 
And while we were talking to him about doing Laugh-In, his people were advising him not to do it. And all we wanted him to do was say Saka to me. And it was difficult because it would Saka to me. No, no, no. It's really, if you could just say it, kind of smile. Yes, yes, yes. This comedy thing is new to me. <laughs> yeah, Saka to me. Well, so just say Saka to me and smile. And he finally did. We got, I think, five takes. And we got in the car and went back to NBC while his advisors were still discussing how to tell us we couldn't do it. And we put it on the air the next show. And if you remember, Nixon was a totally humorless person. <laughs> and when we put that on the air, saying "suck it" to me, everybody was everybody was stunned. Richard Nixon would do this. He has said afterwards that it helped get him elected, and uh, I had to live with that. Yeah, I never really thought we should be blaming you, but now that you mention it, sure. Well, yeah, I, I would find. But after we did Nixon, we saw the enormous reaction to it because people were stunned to see this stiff actually human and talking, right? And we went to try to get Hubert Humphrey. And uh, we chased him all over the country trying to get him to say, yes, do, sock it to him. And Humphrey later said that he thought that may have cost him the election, that Nixon appearing to have a sense of humor as opposed to Humphrey was very straight. Humphrey said he thought that cost him the election. And as I've said, I, I had to live with that. Well, you produced a wonderful PBS special called The Best of Laugh-In, and then you produced a terrific show on Netflix called Still Laugh-In, The Stars Celebrate. George, are you surprised at the enduring popularity of that show? No, I'm, su I'm not surprised at the necessity of America to laugh. We have to laugh. And it's one of the bodily functions that we absolutely must have. have introducing humor into difficult situations is probably one of the things that helps us get through those situations. So no, I, I'm not surprised at all. We have to laugh. I just wish there was more of it. The rules have gotten more strict and people have gotten more sensitive and they don't mind doing dirty humor. I see too much of that subject matter and the language or whatever, but I adore the, the right, the, the privilege uh, of presenting funny things done by funny people. And it doesn't necessarily have to be comics. You interviewed Robert Wagner. Uh, Robert Wagner was not a comic. He's a brilliant actor and a very, you know, wonderful, but having Robert Wagner do humor introduces a whole different kind of experience. And that's a reason for much of the success I've had. With all the pressure to be politically correct nowadays and everyone getting so easily offended by the slightest off color remark, do you think a show like Laugh-In could be made today? Uh, the rules are more strict today. There's more sensitivity, partially because of the success of Laugh-In. When they saw the power of humor, uh, they all got very, very nervous. We need more humor. And uh, all we need is somebody to just break through. We're doing a couple of things now uh, that I feel will be mildly revolutionary because it breaks the pattern. When you watch television, when you watch late night television, I, I, and I watch a lot of television trying to learn, we miss many, many opportunities. You're not going to find anything funnier than Donald Trump. Oh, I'm going to do a thing with Donald Trump clips where I'm going to take those clips and add music and rim shots and playoffs and put that on the air as a comedy special, his, 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 his speeches. The way to defeat Donald Trump is by humor. The way to defeat that the political situations that we find ourselves in is through humor. Humor is the panacea. And uh, I've had a lot of, not only a lot of luck, I've had a lot of fun, it's much more fun. I had fun with Dinah Shore and Judy Garland and Doris Day and Rosemary Clinton. I had fun with all of those people. But the real fun is to hear that big, big, big laugh, particularly if you know that that many people are going to be made nervous by it. And uh, that's what I love to do. Well, what I love about what you're saying is that you see the therapeutic benefits of humor, but you also see it as a way of making a statement about what's really happening in the world and in what you've just mentioned about Trump in the political world. Yes. Well, you know, you're not going to find anything funnier than Donald Trump and his uh, statement on how to get a woman's attention. That will live with him forever. It should be run regularly, as the Donald Trump speeches should be edited together like we would edit Laugh-In with rim shots and playoffs and sight gags, because uh, he's dangerous. See, 75 million people voted for Donald Trump. They didn't all go away. So uh, we're working on some things, some things now 
who hopefully will revive some of our uh, success with political satirical humor. It's necessary. George, in 1968, you produced another comedy variety show called Soul, starring Red Fox with Lou Rawls, Martha and the Vandellas, and Nipsey Russell. Some people said it was like a Black version of Laugh-In. What was was the network response to that show? Uh, I think the words they used were, no way. Really? Uh, (laughs) Red Fox had been a, a partnership with Slappy White, and one of the writers, it was Don Rio, worked with him. And so I went to see Red Fox and I told him what we wanted to do. And I said, uh, I said, and Red, guess what? It's television. You can say anything you want, use any language you want, any subject matter you want. And he said, you, I can do that. I said, yeah, but what he didn't know is that I could edit all of that out. So we went into a studio and we taped a lot of stuff with Red Fox. There was nothing black on the air. There were no black artists. There were Nat Cole and black performers, but no black comics. And so we, we, put together this whole thing called Soul and starring Red Fox and Pearl Bailey. And it went on the air and it did, it did huge. The network ran it for the black meeting and the white meetings. They ran the show and the reaction was so strong. They said they could never cancel it. So they didn't buy it as a series because they said if they put it on the air with that kind of a reaction, they could never air it, never cancel it. So I sent it to the Wayne brothers and I said, here's a show I did, got a huge reaction and you as a black family can do this, they won't buy it from me. And that became the Wayne brothers in living color. See, much of my success has been the result of of failure. (laughs) So what's the message in that? I mean, it sounds like you follow your instincts and you don't take no for an answer. True, true, true. It's, it's difficult today even to take yes for an answer because they don't mean it. The, the secret, I think, is to see the glass as uh, half empty or half full, you know. Uh, the secret of it is to have a good time. Red Fox came in and we did an interview with Red Fox and Slappy White as the first African-American vice president. We put that on the air and during a political season, the idea of having a black president was abhorrent to much of the country. But Red Fox went on and uh, said, well, Mr. Provider, all the people in your administration, the interviewing vice president, are are, are white. Why is that? He said, ain't no black people owe me money. And we went on with this and and it it, it was funny. God, it was funny. And uh, it became the Wayan Brothers. And then uh, it opened the door, really realizing black people have done much of our humor over the years, Amos and Andy and all of those shows contributed a great deal to our sense of humor. And, well, uh, and you, George, you've contributed a great deal in advocating for minority rights and specifically Black people. You did a lot for Sammy Davis Jr. You did yes. a lot for Nat King Cole. I don't yes. think the public really knows how much you've advocated to try to level the playing field in the industry. Nor nor should they know. See, my my goal was not to open doors for black people. My goal was to find a way to laugh. And when that's your goal, it's much more simple to explain it and to function that way. Laughter, laughter is the panacea. You know, you see the man walking down the street with a big tall hat, you see a kid with a bunch of snowballs, you just know what's gonna happen. It's how you get there that makes it funny. So I believe I believe that laughter may be our panacea. It may be our way out of the mess that we're now, <laughs> we're now in. Another iconic show that you worked on was Cher's TV show after she broke up with Sonny. She said that she didn't like hosting a show on her own, so she went back to doing a variety show with Sonny, which did not last very long. What was Cher like to work with back in those days? (laughs) How much time do we have? All day. Cher was not just a performer. Cher was an event. And I saw the interview she did recently, and it was great. We met Sonny and Cher. And they were, they were this, this kind of rock and roll couple, you know, they were totally off base. And uh, I was fascinated with both of them. Sonny was a very bright guy, but we fell in love with the two of them. We did Cher's first appearance on television away from Sonny Bono. Uh, that was an adventure because she, uh, she was not comfortable without Sonny. When we read this script, nobody under, nobody had seen the show yet. And uh, nobody realized that uh, there was no music in it. Sonny Bono was looking through this script and he said, well, 
where's Cher's song? And I went, oh my God, he doesn't understand. This is a comedy show. There is no Cher song. So I did the only thing I could do. I lied. <laughs> I called Billy Barnes. I said, but Billy, where's Cher's song? And he looked at me like I'd slapped him. Cher's song. I said, you know, uh, the Mountie number. There was no Mountie number. So we go up and he says, what are you talking about? That's, I said, write me a Mountie number. I said, if Cher needs a song, write me a Mountie number. I'm a Mountie, you're a Mountie. Number. And he said, George, that's not a number. Those are jokes. Said, write me a Mountie number. Billy Barnes, God love him, 15 minutes later came back in with a Mountie number for Cher, which we, we did. And she came on the show and it was absolute delight. And we, uh, we went to dinner in Palm Springs and Cher Sonny came over to the place we were staying at Palm Springs. And my little daughter opened the door and saw Cher and she said, hello, pookie face. Well, Cher, <laughs> Cher went, pookie face? And that became a kind of a running thing. And so we developed a wonderful relationship with Cher who, is, who is, was always, I always thought capable of much more than, uh, than she did. And so the, the music worked because she was a unique musical performer, but her sense of comedy was was uh, what was a surprise. And to this day, she still is a very very funny lady and good friend, and I adore her and I cherish the moments we had together. Well, I'm wondering why wasn't anyone able to convince her that she was doing fine on her own? Her show was getting great ratings. Yeah. It wasn't necessary to go back to Sunny. The public was not going to buy. And they were divorced now. She was remarried to somebody else. Why couldn't she be convinced to keep going as a solo artist with well, her own did. variety show? She did a lot of excellent variety shows. We did it with Don Rio and Alan Katz. She did a lot of great variety shows. And it was, it was very interesting. I, I, she has a minimal attention span. And uh, I don't think she was thrilled with the amount of work and time and effort that went into a variety show. She's a very special lady unique, unlike anyone else before or since. I cherish the times we had with Cher and uh, the moments, and some very, very funny moments with Cher. She's a talented lady, but a totally unique personality, unique woman, and, and a good friend. Well, that was a real classic show. And you know, in your heyday, there were loads of variety shows on TV. Why do you think we don't have variety shows anymore? Well, variety, uh, musical shows today, they come in with their record and they go in the studio and they play the record with the sound and that's it. They, nobody really wants to spend the time uh, that it takes to do a variety show like Dinah, like Judy, like Doris Day, like the specials in the series that we did. Nobody really wants to spend the time. They're out on the road selling records. But the next explosion will be with performers performing comedy because we need it as a civilization, as a country, as a the time in history, humor may be part of the way we can get through this quagmire in which we find ourselves sinking slowly. But you do know, George, that aside from the comedy, you produced a number of iconic TV specials, including Frank Sinatra's 80th birthday special, Sammy yes. Davis's 60th anniversary celebration, the Muhammad Ali 50th and 60th birthday celebrations, the USO's 50th anniversary, and dozens more. These shows were not only real extravaganzas, they were major events. Were you aware at the time that you were creating important pieces of show business history? Well, you become aware of that later, not during. That's not the reason to do the show. It's the result of doing the show. I wanted to sell a special with Sammy Davis, who I had known for 100 years, ever since he was a young man. And so I couldn't sell the special until finally I got a commitment to do one hour special with Sammy Davis. And I went to see Sammy and they, his lawyers said, George, you have a problem. Just found out Sammy has throat cancer and he's going to need chemotherapy and he can't do the show because he's got throat cancer. So I, I went to Sammy and as with all problems, the problem can be turned around and it works for you. So I said, Sammy, uh, I understand you have throat cancer and you have a problem. Now, I have a problem. I've sold a show with you as the star, celebrating your career, and you have to be there. Throat cancer and no throat cancer. So I said, I'll go ahead with the show, but tell me you're going to be there. Sammy said, I'll be there, but he had to have throat therapy every day. And so we then, once we announced that Sammy had throat cancer, everybody in the world agreed to do the show. 
It was an impossible event to book a Sammy Davis show when everybody who wanted to book was more important than Sammy. So we went to Frank and Frank said he would do the show and that was impossible to get. For Frank not to do a guest shout on the comedy show. So we put that together and, and, it, and it worked. It was just, it was, it was a magical show. Everybody did it. And it was history. It was history. And one of the things was I talked to Shirley Rhodes and I talked to Sammy's wife and people that were around Sam. And I said, go in his closet and get me a pair of his shoes and put them underneath the chair. We set Sammy up over on the side and the audience was over here. And I said, and uh, so they put the shoes underneath the chair. And I said to Greg Hines, after your number, go over and give Sammy the shoes. And Greg said, I can't do that. He told me he doesn't want to get up. I said, Greg, the man has been up five times taken about. Give him those shoes. So when you see the show, you'll see Greg complete his number and walk off. And then I'm standing on the side saying, so he goes over, gives Sammy the shoes, and the audience exploded. And Sammy took the shoes, put them on, walked up those steps, and Greg said to him, do you want to do a little shine? Shine on your shoes. And Sammy said, make it easy on yourself. And we realized at that point, Sammy intended to dance. And if you see that clip, it's magnificent because Greg and Sammy are doing a challenge dance. Sammy, who's been in chemotherapy for the past six, eight weeks, 10 weeks, is doing everything Greg did Sammy would do. And eventually, Greg just dropped to his knees and kissed Sammy's shoes. It became a classic moment in television. So you hope for those moments. You set up the, the environment. You set up the situation for something like that to happen. And you hope that it does. And uh, we well, sure did with that Sammy Davis special. Oh, did it ever. It was unforgettable. And another one of my favorite specials that you produced was in 1989 with Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. and Liza called Frank, Liza and Sammy, the ultimate event. Yes. I think it was supposed to be Dean Martin that was originally going to be in the show. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Most of my successes have been the result of impossible events. The Sammy Davis show, the, the Frank Sinatra show. My daughter, Maria, who didn't understand that things were impossible, would just go in and help me do them. It worked. And if you took impossible ingredients and put them together with some intelligence and a sense of humor, realizing that a television show is just that. It's only a television show. This is not history. And the history part comes as a result of the show, not the reason to do it. So uh, when we put Sammy and then Frank, and Dean was supposed to do it and got sick. And we replaced uh, Dean with uh, Liza Minnelli. We replaced it with and the show was a big, big hit. I think when that won another award for Maria, it was like magic. Magic happens by accident. You don't say, let's do a magical television show. No way. But let's do a television show with diverse, unpredictable elements, and the magic will emerge. At least it has frequently with me. Or often, never mind free. Seldom with me, occasionally with me, I'll settle. Well, I get the feeling when I talk to you that you're surprised by your own success. Amazed, amazed by my own success, because my own success has been born out of the result of impossible situations. When you have a show with Dean and Frank and Sammy and Dean's not going to show up, you have a problem. <laughs> but but it's, it's how, how do you handle that problem? And then, the setbacks are what make it an exciting way to make a living. You and Whoopi Goldberg produced an excellent documentary about Moms Mabley, one of my all-time favorites. You got an Emmy nomination for that. Did you ever get to work with Moms Mabley, George? Yeah, I got to know Moms Mabley, and uh, she was an event. She was, again, a woman that uh, had no way to be in show business. However, when that little door opens and you put her in there, Mom's Mabley exploded. She became an important television event, more than a personality. Mom's was an event. And Whoopi did Mom's Mabley perfectly. And Mom's, Mom's Mabley, to anybody that knows comedy, lives today. And Whoopi did a great Mom's Mabley. Well, you know, the thing, I mean, you, you've talked about Sammy. We've talked about, you've mentioned Nat King Cole and Nipsey Russell and Mom's Mabley. Did you have to combat racism in Hollywood in the work you wanted to do? With what we did, I think we defeated racism in Hollywood. Nat Cole was working in a little club, on, uh, on the, the Tiffany Club, 
in South Los Angeles. And uh, I was working at Ciro's. I was manager at Ciro's and I was booking the shows at this famous nightclub, Ciro's. And I said to the owner, I said, look, every spring and fall, there's graduation ceremonies and those kids know and love Nat Cole. Let's book Nat Cole and Cole into Ciro's, which was, it didn't happen. I mean, there were no black artists working on the Sunset Strip. So we booked Nat Cole in and then at six o'clock at night, the owner calls and says, any reservations? I said, oh, it's going great. There wasn't one reservation at six o'clock. At seven o'clock, no reservations. But by eight o'clock, the place was jammed with these kids. And so we booked Nat Cole twice a year and uh, I've developed a great relationship with Nat. Going against, going against tradition, uh, taking an adventures, what television today, the adventure is how to use dirty words and how to, you know, that's not it. The, advent, the adventure today is humor. But a lot of your shows really celebrate people. They go beyond humor. You've celebrated some of the greatest talents in the world. Look at your strong support of women. In 1982, you created a variety show with a feminist perspective called The Shape of Things. That's and right. you hired the first female director, I think, didn't you? Right. The whole staff was women. We had a great writer working with us, Digby Wolf, and he was working with the Watts Writers uh, Workshop. And uh, they were, had a bunch of young women. So we brought them in to write the material for that show. And Lee Grant was the first woman director doing a television show, in, a comedy show in California. And uh, Brenda Vaccaro, won an Emmy for that show, but it was the idea of doing a show strictly based upon the woman's point of view and women's concerns, and it was funny. Boy, I mean, it was a totally unpredictable group of people, Phyllis Diller and Joan Rivers. It was, it was all women, and that in itself was so unusual. Women were not the joke. Well, the jokes are in threes, set up, joke, payoff. Women always got the middle joke. That show gave the woman the first and the last joke, that's the payoff. And it was a big, big, big hit. And it opened a lot of doors. And I think, as I say, Valerie Harper won an Emmy. Lee Grant became a very, very uh, important director. If you just take reality and turn it around a little bit, there were no women dominated television shows at that point. Just turn it that far and you have, uh, you have history. It doesn't always work, but the temptation to risk failure is in itself the excitement of being in this business. We did it with The Shape of Things. We did it with the all-black comedy show. We did it with Laugh-In. We did it, uh, it doesn't always work. I did another show. NBC said they wanted to do another show that would be an adventure. So I said, well, there's all kinds of new things and new techniques and so forth. So I said, let's do a show. And I sold a show called Turn On. And I loved that show because it was all unknown people and it had uh, sound effects, it didn't have an audience, it had sound effects and rim shots. It was, it was truly unique. NBC saw the pilot and liked it so much, they extended the commitment from 13 shows to 18 shows and a huge amount of promotion. They were really excited. So we're getting ready to put Turn On on the air and there's a guy in Cleveland who said, uh, uh, we can't air this because the show was replacing Peyton Place and he said, we're going to lose Peyton Place in this show with unknown people. So he called the stations as we show aired in New York. And as it came across the country, they were canceling at one station at a time. So they finally got to California and it was off the air. And uh, so Turn On never aired. And part of my commitment to get any money at all is if I agreed never to air it. And so it sits on a shelf because it was the only way I could get paid for the show. And now it's long enough ago, I'm getting ready to put turn on on the air and show people with all the excitement about. It seems so simple and, and easy today, but at that point, I guess it was a bit revolutionary. Well, revolutionary. Wh when you look at yourself. Yes, I, I, I try not to. Well, I'm asking you to look at yourself and tell me, what do you think it is about you or the way you were raised or the what's inside your soul that made you such a trailblazer because you did things that no one else was doing and you did it over and over again. I think probably the greatest stimulation in my life was my defeats. <laughs> I was very young and I had polio and I had mononucleosis and I, I had all kinds of accidents and so forth. And my mother was a concert violinist and a bright, bright woman. And uh, she was a Christian scientist. 
and she convinced me that I could overcome anything. If I just set my mind to it, you could, the power of uh, the mind, and that helped me so much to overcome all kinds of, uh, of adversity. I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of big successes, but I have had some resounding, <laughs> resounding failures. And I cherish both the failures and the successes. Well, you know, here's another thing, George. You are a man who has learned how to deal with very, very powerful women. You mentioned Judy Garland, Cher. You worked with Dinah Shore, Lucille Ball, Bette Midler. You seem to know how to manage and get the best out of very, very unique and extremely mega talented superstar women. The most important of all of the women you list is a woman by the name of Jolene Brand. And Jolene Brand, we, I, was play, I was producing the shows at Ciro's and we were auditioning girls. And this one gorgeous lady showed up to audition. She was gorgeous, but not a great dancer. So I didn't hire her, but I came in the next day and there she was. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, Mr. Hover hired me. I said, well, so I, she was gorgeous. I put her in the back of the line because she was not, I needed a lead dancer. And uh, by about the third nights, uh, people started coming to the show to see this beautiful girl. You know, all the guys started hitting and saying, I want to meet this girl. I said, okay, you can talk to her, but be careful because she's dating a very ugly guy and you could get hurt. So all the guys talked to Jolene, but none of them, she said, they're talking to me, but nobody invites me out. I said, well, that's too bad. I'll invite you out. So I started dating Jolie, and it didn't take but a nanosecond really for me to become absolutely fascinated by her. And so, so then we socially met Ernie Kovacs one night, who absolutely adored Jolie. And she said, this woman. So he started taping the Ernie Kovacs show. And uh, I was doing the Dinah Shore summer show with Edie Adams. She was married to Ernie Kovacs. And Ernie absolutely adored Jolie. And she never asked, what am I going to do? She never asked why. She just showed up and did it. And uh, Ernie loved her. And she became the girl in the tub. And she became part of the Nairobi trio. But of all the women you listed, the most important one was Jolene Brand. The you next mean, to that would be Maria Slaughter. And what about Lucille Ball? People said she was difficult. Did you find her difficult to work with? Yes, of course. I mean, difficult, difficult is not... Uh, the reason for failure, many times it's the reason for success. I was doing the Dinah Shore Chevy show and Lucy and Ball, Lucy and Desi used to come into Ciro's at night and uh, they came there the night they bought the house on Roxbury. They had this young son, Desi Jr. And she said, could we do anything? He had a rock and roll band. So I booked little Desi on the Dinah Shore Chevy show. Later on, I'm now doing the Steve Lawrence show and Steve was the last buy on CBS and he was not the most important variety star at that point and so I, I called Lucy and I said would she do the show and she said why would I do that show and I said well okay okay but what am I going to do with this elephant <laughs> how does my elephant prop what elephant said, well I have this pink elephant for you and Steve to ride coming down Schubert Alley on Saturday night at 11 o'clock singing together pink elephant you have the elephant she said okay she said she said, what time do you need me? So anyhow, Lucy came to New York and did the Steve Lawrence show riding a pink elephant down Schubert Alley. And I was arrested. Lucy wouldn't let me go to jail without the elephant. And we became a relationship that went on and on. And later, I do a Dinah Shore show. And Lucy came to New York to do the show. And one of the guest stars was Diana Ross. And Lucy and, uh, and Diana did this special with Diana Ross. And they were they were naughty. They kept diverting her attention so she wouldn't get on camera. And uh, so I had to tell him, I said, Lucy, stop diverting Diana Ross's attention. So eventually you'll see the show, but occasionally Diana Ross turns around and look at Lucy. Lucy was an adventure. I just, I loved her. And uh, we did the Diana Ross show. We did the uh, laughing. And now little Lucy is, uh, they have this whole community that they've established, Jamestown, where it was Lucy where she grew up. Right. And uh, so that's a whole 38 acres of uh, comedy collection where we're, they came to me and said, uh, uh, this wonderful, wonderful lady is the curator. And she came to me and said, could I give her anything from Laugh-In? Her name is Journey. And I said, yes. Yeah. So I sent her some clips. She said, this is great. Do we have anything else? I said, what do you mean else? I have a warehouse full of else. 
So we began to feed this uh, event they have in, in Jamestown. So now in May, we're going to do a whole celebration where I'm putting my, <laughs> my entire collection of comedy memorabilia into this, not a museum, it's a collection. And so we're going to go back and, and introduce the book I've written called Still Laughing, which is a collection of not tell all, it's a collection of funny episodes, my mistakes, my failures, my uh, recoveries, and uh, it's called Still Laughing. And that's going to be introduced at this uh, uh, Jamestown event. And comedy, comedy is our, is, is our solution. Comedy was a problem for a long time. And now, and now I'm convinced that comedy is part of the, our solution. There's a way out of this quagmire in which we find ourselves politically and economically. It will be to the people who will help us laugh. And uh, that, that's worked for me. And so I continue to stay on that vein until somebody catches on and I get drummed out of show business. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You know, although most of your work was in television, you did co-write a wonderful movie entitled Norman, Is That You?, which you also directed, starring Pearl Bailey, Red Fox, and Michael Warren. Why yeah. didn't you make more movies? Well, the movies, I mean, I love movies. I love to see it, but movies take so much time. You know, I worked on that show for two years just trying to sell it. It was the first show about a gay couple, and I couldn't sell it till I book Pearl Bailey and Red Fox, because they too were not acceptable, but putting them together in this uh, unbelievable situation of a, of a gay male couple, and it got made. But I love movies, but it takes so long, and it takes, and there's so many people voting on a movie today, whereas television, I had the clout to pretty much do whatever I wanted, and that freedom helped me do some of the other shows that you've mentioned. I love to watch movies, but boy, it takes a long time and there's so many people voting and there's so many and the distributor and the studio and all of that. In television, I have autonomy. So I kind of had decided to stay there. And not only did I decide to stay there, Motion Pictures decided that I should stay in television. <laughs> <laughs> well, I loved that movie. I want you to know that. As a young gay man, that movie was very validating for me. So I want you to know that you affected an early generation of men who were trying to have the courage to live their authentic selves. It was, it was, it was a revolution. First of all, it was black, right? That was, uh, and selling a movie about two black, two gay men with Red Fox and Pearl Bailey. And Pearl Bailey had worked for me at Ciro's and uh, her act was, was a, a bit bawdy. Her favorite line was, if I can't sell it, I'm going to sit down on it because I ain't giving nothing away. Well, that was Pearl. And Red Fox could not get on movies or television. He had the one thing on the Red Fox show. And so I talked to Red about doing the show. He came in. He read it as an actor. And so Norman, is that you became a real adventure. And I did it on videotape. So I, that was another adventure, was doing a motion picture on videotape. But it gave me the freedom to use multiple cameras and to edit it the way I wanted it. And so I put it together. And the idea of an acceptable gay couple, two men, two very attractive men, why not? Today, you don't think anything about it at all. But I believe that was the, I believe that was the first time a gay, male gay couple was uh, not only seen on television, but, it, but appreciated and accepted on television. So I'm, I'm glad you liked it. But it was I sure just... did. You've publicly said, George, that of all the things you've achieved in your career, you're the most proudest of creating the American Comedy Awards. Is that right? Yes. Tell us I why. Believe, because I believe that we should celebrate comedy. I believe comedy has always been a dangerous area. It was a dangerous area when I worked with Ernie Kovacs and Sid Caesar and Jackie Gleason and, uh, and Danny Thomas. Television... Comedy was always dangerous. That's what made it comedy. You have to, you see the guy with the hat and the kid with the snowball, you know what was coming. And the celebration of comedy is maybe part of our answer that can get us through this mess we're in. And there's nothing feels better than a big laugh. Well, there's a couple of things that feel better, but a big laugh is, is gratifying and it's relieving and so forth. And I believe that the necessity of laughter is becoming more and more obvious. Well, as much as you enjoyed working with the greatest stars of all time, 
I can tell that you really loved helping create stars, people like Goldie Hawn, Lily Tomlin, Robin Williams, so many more. Who are some of the young stars that you developed that you're the most proud of? You mentioned, I mean, Flip Wilson was one. Uh, Robin Williams was one. Uh, uh, Roseanne Arnold was one that couldn't get on the air. If we, get, if we can shed and brush away all of the rules and you find somebody who doesn't fit the rules or somebody who goes against the grain. I mean, and you got to realize you walk in with Phyllis Diller, there was no way to sell Phyllis Diller, a woman that was self-deprecating. But, but when she came on, she was huge. And the same thing with the, a lot of those women, you know, and Goldie, Goldie was just a gold mine, you know, because she was not a comic, she was a dancer. But, but a delightful personality. And Lily, Lily Tomlin, Lily Tomlin came in the office. She sat down in a chair and she started doing these characters who were just voices. And I mean, Ernestine, the telephone operator who called and intimidated world leaders. And I found that very, very funny. So we started adding up Lily's characters and uh, she became a major part of the success of laughing as did Goldie and Ruth Buzzy and Joanne Worley. They brought in, uh, they, were, they, were, they were female comedy. It was Lucille Ball and then Audrey Meadows and all of those women. But I think maybe we they, they, they didn't get the punchline. There's the jokes are in threes, the set up joke punchline. We gave woman that end joke. And that was part of what made those stars happen. When you think Ruth Buzzy was, in, Ruth Buzzy did all of those characters and uh, they were, every one of them was delightful. And Joanne Worley, Joanne Worley was at a major event. And my, my own enjoyment, partially because of my mom, and partially because of my marriage to Jolene, and partially because of my daughter, Maria and AJ, I've had wonderful experiences and delightful successes with my enjoyment, my appreciation, my respect for women. And comedy, comedy itself is partially, if not solely responsible for our survival. We must, we must laugh. We must, uh, you've got to see that guy walking down the street with the kid with the snowball. And I tend to stay there as long as I'm around. And, my daughter Maria has produced, right? Maria won Emmys for a lot of the shows you mentioned. She grew up in the environment of the glass is half empty, right? The glass is not only half empty, but it's on the edge of the table and uh, side gags. Your it, interview with R.J. Wagner was wonderful. He sounded intelligent and attractive and he's a movie star and he's with uh, Jill St. John. And I loved your interview with R.J. Wagner. And I had hoped when we talked that I would sound half as brilliant as R.J. did. And I'm afraid I don't. But uh, Oh, I, mean, I would beg to differ. I love R.J. R.J. and I both love you. And I'm just so thrilled to have this opportunity to tell you how really special you are. And another reason I think you're special, George, you're too humble to say this, so I'm going to say it. You've been very generous in producing shows and raising a lot of money for juvenile diabetes research. And I want to thank you publicly for everything you've done for this important cause. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed the stuff with Barbara Davis and her Carousel of Hope Ball. We've done like 30 years of that. We, we who have achieved, we who enjoy success and profit from that success, really have to continue our effort to help the people who have not had that success. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of my enjoyment of life has come from some of the things that you mentioned. We've got to do more. Our answer, we keep searching for the answer. We are the answer. We are the answer to raise the money for the juvenile debate, for Barbara Davis Clinic, for all of those things. We who have achieved, we who enjoy success uh, should really focus more on using that success because there are people who have not been as lucky as we are with, with whom we should uh, spend more time and and uh, try to develop other things. I want to tell our viewers that you can find out more about George Schlatter by going to his official website, georgeschlatter.com. Well, Mr. George Schlatter, I have only one more question for you. Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready because, uh, uh, yes, I'm ready. How, for, how do you want to be remembered? At all. <laughs> At mean, all. How do you want to be remembered? No, I mean it. Now, I want you to be serious. I... But it's an interesting question. I want to be remembered as somebody who really tried. 
and someone who was enormously lucky and was able to take advantage of much of my luck with Jolene, with my daughter Maria and AJ, the ability not only to overcome adversity, but to enjoy it. <laughs> I mean, I've had more fun talking about the turn on being canceled after 30 minutes than I've had with some of the successes because that was an adventure. We've got to look for the adventure. We've got to appreciate our failures, not as an end, but as part of the journey and enjoy each other. My dear George, I honestly, I'm finding it difficult to find the words to tell you just how much your work has meant to me over the years. It's been a huge honor having you on our show. I can't wait for the documentary. I can't wait for your book to come out in May. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you. This was great fun. Thank you. And we'll do it again sometime when I can think of something more intelligent and funny to tell you. Let me tell you, you're perfect. Our guest has been the legendary George Slaughter. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, to my wonderful management team, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and to my team at XPTV1 in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.